Welcome to the Physical as well as Virtual Jordan Center. My name is Rosin Jagalov. I teach in the Russian and Slavic Studies Department. Um, and, uh, and I'm not a historian, uh, uh, but even with my untrained eye, it's, it's quite obvious that one of the most dynamic fields within Soviet historiography is that of Soviet internationalism, especially during the Cold War era. Uh, within that field, one of the most interesting scholars is Severian Diakonov, from whom we'll be hearing today. He graduated uh, from the Geneva International Institute less than uh, two years ago, but his dissertation is already well on its way to becoming a book under the title of Soviet Public Diplomacy in India, 1959-1965. Um, that will hopefully come out at Cornell University Press. Uh, currently, he's, uh, he's completing, uh, he, he's working on a project on the Soviet Red Cross and the International Red Cross movement between the 1950s and 1980s, and that he will be telling us more about later. As a historian of internationalism, Sibirian is a profoundly international person himself, uh, being born in, North, in uh, Norilsk in northern Russia, then completing his bachelor's degree in France, in Paris, if I'm not mistaken, and, and master's in Montreal before going on to his PhD in Switzerland. Um, uh, last year, uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Davis Center at Harvard. Um, this year, thanks to the Swiss National Science Foundation, we are really very lucky to have him at the Jordan Center. Uh, he, his research is also profoundly international, and I'm barely managing to keep up with his movements from uh, one archive and country to another. And I'm very happy with you, you will be telling us what he's been up to in recent months. Thank you, Sevignan. The floor is yours. Thank you for this generous introduction. Thank you, Jordan Center, for having me here, um, being able to talk for that long. It will be the first time for me to have that much time on this. So, yeah. Uh, so as Rosen was telling, I did my PhD and I was working on Soviet influence in India during the Cold War. And there in the research, I came to Soviet uh, Red Cross represent a small hospital in Delhi. And I thought that it would be one of my agencies that I would put into my PhD. And then when I was working on Soviet Red Cross, I understood that it's a lot larger topic. And there is basically nothing written about Cold War and the Soviet Red Cross, and actually not so much about any other National Red Cross Society during the Cold War. Um, okay. So uh, there, is, there are these new books on the topic of Cold War in international organizations. They really like came out in the last two, three years, one of them about International Adam Agency, about U UN Development Agency, and Louis, uh, Louis Porter's book is about UNESCO and <clears throat> Soviet representation of UNESCO. And I kind of follow his uh, idea about that Soviet Union wanted to join Western-based international organizations and to push for their socialist agenda. But at the same time, this put Geneva and New York organizations on the top of international governance. It's kind of undermine Soviet Comcon organization and the socialist organizations as global. And it's interesting to see why actually Soviet Union wanted to do that in the first place. And I suppose that they did that because in the 1950s and 1960s, there was the process of decolonization and many new countries were joining these international organizations. And that's why for the Soviet Union, it was very important to be part of that scene and try to work in this Cold War dynamics through this organization. So my theme is the International League of the Red Cross and Soviet presence in there. The League was uh, established just after the First World War and Soviet Union became very much engaged into the organization. 
So that's the poster from 1967. And it shows a lot about what Soviet Red Cross meant. It says, Soviet Red Cross in our country celebrates its 100 years anniversary. It doesn't say that it's Soviet Red Cross. It just says the Red Cross in our country, meaning that the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, work in the same country, our country, and they, but they don't call it this way. What the main kind of argument I'm trying to say is <laughs> that the Soviet Union tried to uh, reformulate what meant humanitarianism and equate socialist values with uh, humanitarian values. And they wanted to tell to this new scene where there were decolonizing countries, decolonized countries in the League of the Red Cross, that the Soviet Union had their own explanation of what was humanitarianism. And they were presenting that people who worked in voluntary organizations in the decolonized world and in the West, they had more kind of left-wing values. And they were kind of allies of the socialist uh, project of the Soviet Union. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to show one picture from uh, later years from 1984. It's a film made by the Soviet Red Cross and we're talking about that people who created the Red Cross back in the 1860s, back in the 19th century, they already had this kind of left-leaning uh, ideas. And these ideas, they had their own force and all people who work in the voluntary organization, they're kind of more like left-wing. And this is a film uh, uh, made in 1984 that talks about the history of the Russian Red Cross and Soviet Red Cross. And then there was the still where I, I see that this is the uh, Russian imperial family during the First World War, where this empress and her daughters, they were serving as nurses uh, for the wounded uh, Russian imperial soldiers in St. Petersburg. But in the film, they, they were showing that the Red Cross was involved with all uh, strata of society. And they showed this uh, picture without actually naming who these people were. Huh? Yeah. So what was the Soviet Red Cross from already in 1920s and 30s? It became a very massive organization. In 1950s, they were 40 million people engaged into as members. Then a few years, there were 50 million people. In 1982, they had 120 million members, which meant like everyone was part of the movement. But there are many explanations why, why they were doing it. The Soviet Red Cross existed on this membership fees. People would pay like some few rubles a year. They, they had their ticket that they were members. They would get some materials sometimes, but in most of their life, they would never hear anything about the, the Red Cross. So basically Soviet citizens were kind of taxed. They, there was sort of an official tax and everyone had to pay and be part of the moon. At the same time, it was like a, a immediate tool. People knew something about the Red Cross. They knew that there, there was international movement. They knew there were people around the world who were part of their national societies and that the Soviet Union was part of this international cooperation of Red Cross societies in Geneva. Yeah, oh, that's the scheme, how the International Red Cross operates. It's very hard to understand. <laughs> And still, I don't get what's going on there. <laughs> so the Russian Red Cross was founded in 1867. Then after the revolution, the, the Soviet Red Cross was uh, organized. <clears throat> and then in 1921, the International Commission of the Red Cross in Geneva recognized the Soviet Red Cross as the only uh, Red Cross, the heir of the Russian imperial. Then in 1934, the Soviet uh, Red Cross joined the League of the Red Cross in Geneva. That was part of this uh, Stalin idea to integrate in the League of Nations and to create this alliance against Germany. <clears throat> but they were not very active at that time. Things happened after the Second World War, when 1946, Soviet Red Cross was elected in the Board of Governors of the League of Red Cross. And kind of Soviet representative was sort of a vice president of the League of Red Cross. They were several countries in the board 
and Soviet Union was there always throughout the Cold War. And in 1952, the Soviet Red Cross was elected in the Standing Commission in the very center here. That's several countries are in the, in the Standing Commission and they are coordinating relations between the League, the ICRC and national societies. And kind of, they were tracking all the political situation uh, all the time. So in, during the Cold War, all international organizations had a lot more importance for global politics <clears throat> than they did after the Cold War. Uh, Georgi Mitirov, the head of the Soviet Red Cross from 1954 to 1971, was the Minister of Healthcare of the Soviet Union throughout the Second World War from 1939 to 1947. His kind of 1950s American counterpart, Alfred Grunter, was a general that fought, that was in the Second World War, and then he was commander of NATO forces in Europe from 1953 to 56. And after that, he was the head of the American Red Cross from 57 to 64. And you can imagine the level of expertise of that of these people at back then. So I'm not criticizing what's going on, but it's it's not the same dynamics of power that the League, the Federation of the Red Cross, having now that it had back then. So the League, apparently, what we can claim that it was the most universal international organization uh, at that time. It had both North and South Korea since 1954. They had two Germanys, and they had uh, to Vietnam, they had the communist China inside the league and not Taiwan. It was the reverse situation that it was happening in the United Nations because in, in the United Nations, there was the Taiwan 1970s and there was no communist China. For North Korea, the league was the only international scene <clears throat> where they could act and, and speak out until the end of the 1970s. <clears throat> Yeah, so by 1970, Soviet Red Cross was very much in, engaged in the humanitarian aid, and <laughs> they were claiming that they had 100 of operation by, by then. And most of them you can see there in Africa and in Asia and the colonized world. This is a map from CIA when they are supposing that all of these Soviet hospitals were cover up for intelligence operations. But that's of course would be possible as well. But I I did I never saw archival material to prove that. So in the 1960s, the Soviet Red Cross had permanent presence in Algeria, Ethiopia. There is a Russian Red Cross hospital there now, in Iran, Afghanistan, India, and Cambodia. <clears throat> These are pictures from uh, Soviet Red Cross journal. <coughs> And I worked uh, with documents about India and what was happening, there were a uh, pediatrics hospital in Delhi and they had something like 12, 15 people, Soviet doctors, researchers, nurses uh, working in the hospital and they would treat something like 4,000 patients a year. So it was not kind of huge presence. There were some present, but uh, Permanent. And what they were doing, apart from actual treating patients, they were publishing a lot of medical articles in uh, uh, medical journals in India. So they were part of kind of medical community and were uh, giving lectures at medical universities. And were trying to be very active in that as well. <clears throat> so when you work on this topic, by names of people, you understand that most of these doctors and this like ninety percent of them, they were female. They were all of them female doctors because by nineteen sixties, most of medical professions in Soviet Union were occupied by women, and it, uh, there was some sort of uh, gendered division of labor. Uh, in the Soviet Union back then, when <clears throat> very talented boys, if they wanted to do something 
the most respected profession in 65, they would be channeled to go to math and physics, and girls would be channeled to go to medicine and biology and chemistry. So they were professions with, with more women than men and the other way around. Like in medicine, <clears throat> it was where uh, there were very few surgeons, for example, but female surgeons, but it was a male profession. Yeah, so we can come to the, one of the films was made by the Soviet Red Oh, I need to close this guy and then first. So it was. The film was made in 1965 about the uh, work of the Soviet Red Cross. And this is about the hospital in Cambodia. Tatyana Karash, a pupil of the famous Soviet scientist Filatov, was the chief consultant of the ophthalmology department for several years. News of the miracles performed by the Soviet doctor spread throughout the country. It also reached the Buddhist temples. Many of the monks were in need of eye operations, but their religion does not permit women's hands to touch members of the religious order. However, the great desire to regain their sight overcame their age-old superstitions. Many Buddhist monks can see again thanks to medical science and the gifted surgeon Tatyana Karash. Okay. Uh, just can't play from the current slide. Yep. Uh -huh. So, yeah, so here you can see the situation when. Uh, at the beginning, the woman having a female doctor was a problem, and then they overcame the superstitions, and there was this modernity happening in Cambodia. <laughs> but there was a different cases, like in the uh, Algerian War, Soviet Red Cross and Yugoslavian Red Cross, they uh, made hospitals in Tunisia, and they were having this influx of <laughs> Algerian refugees. And for example, there was a very specific case about Yugoslavian doctors that when uh, refugee women needed treatment from gynecologists, most of doctors from Yugoslavian Red Cross were male. And women, they, were, they didn't want to be treated by male gynecologists, so they shifted to the Soviet Red Cross, where most of doctors were female for any uh, medical profession. And for that, it was easier for Soviet doctors to operate in certain areas. So it's interesting to see how sometimes it's easy for them and sometimes it was difficult. And I imagine there were situations when <clears throat> this was seen as something really bad when there was female doctors, but I didn't work in the Moscow archives yet for that. Yeah, this is uh, from the film from, from the Algerian war. So one of the very interesting topics that came very unexpectedly, <clears throat> it's about the Red Cross International Film Festival that the uh, by the 1960s, for sure, Soviet Union had very big presence in the International Red Cross Movement. And there was the first International Red Cross Movement Film Festival that happened in 1962 after the Cannes Film Festival. But still, it was the time of Algerian war. And then if we imagine in later years, the colonization happened exactly in the 60s. And apparently for many countries, it was not acceptable to come to France as their metropole or the country that they were fighting for. What you see from the documents, it was the initiative of the Bulgarian Red Cross to organize international film festival. And the International League of the Red Cross just agreed and said, yes, it's a great idea. Let's support them. And the Western Red Cross societies were really eager to be part of it. And, and uh, in documents, you never see any problem. And I still find actual um, discussion how it happened. But I suppose it was very much from 
the perspective of integrating the Soviet Union into this uh, Red Cross movement and because of this balance of power. But <clears throat> also it's interesting because I suppose it was not just only uh, important for the Soviet Union to be part of the international scene, but it was important for the West to be inside of the Eastern Bloc and to influence the Eastern Bloc with their ideological product. So the film festival started in 1965, and it was rapidly becoming bigger and bigger. They were always trying to get films from the decolonized countries back then, but the countries were writing that they just didn't have enough material, didn't have films for this. Uh, in 1975, the Wagner International Film Festival got the A-level status as the Cannes Film Festival, Berlin, and Karol Vary Moscow Film Festival. So it was like on the, on the highest uh, position in the international festival world. <clears throat> uh, if you see the jury, they're always uh, representative of Bulgarian Red Cross, Soviet Red Cross, and Yugoslav Red Cross. And later, they were always people from the West, and it was never really like uh, Eastern Bloc festival. They were really trying to create, make it international uh, event. <clears throat> and there was a case when there was a representative of Eastern and Western Germany in the jury. And the films that got the main prizes, they were from the West as well and from the East. Uh, so, I just wanted to keep up with this topic of women as doctors and women uh, rights. Here in the festival, they were systematically talking about this female doctors and uh, topics about women. But it wasn't the main thing. It was just one of the, the topics that came out from the festival. I was looking at one of the films that was from the West and that got the prize and it was made by the French Red Cross about a school for uh, uh, nurses in France. And it was on, on, only made for women nurses. And there is a lot about education, physical education. And when you see it, it's very kind of normative education where they have uniform and very structured and it looks sometimes as a Soviet school. So, and there were uh, later films, like feature films presented at the film festival. And this is a British film that got the uh, gold medal uh, with a lot of criticism <clears throat> of the British uh, psychiatry of that time. So that's the Soviet film that was popular in the Soviet Union about a female doctor. And I wanted to show uh, one little part of the film that shows how they were really pushing for telling that having a female doctor was very normal. So I will go here, right? Yeah. Tell me, what так? Здравствуйте. Добрый день. So this is the main character, Dr. Kalinkova. She is doing some experimental treatment in a small hospital in the provincial town in the Soviet Union. And then in Moscow, in, at the ministry, they understand that there's something strange happening. And they sent a revision commission to the hospital. And, and, and she's kind of meeting these people from Moscow. Здравствуйте. Бумага вас какая или что? А то знаете, как у Гоголя получится. Ну а как же? Уведомляем вас, что благих НА, доктор медицинских наук. So she's reading paper addressed to her <coughs> that someone called благих <coughs> uh, is coming and will make this revision. And she's asking, Это вы благих? Are you благих to this guy? Нет, как раз наоборот. Я Бибиков. Благих я. And, and the lady says that благих is me, <coughs> meaning that this high-standing official from the Ministry of Healthcare, who is a doctor, coming for the, for the inspection, she's a woman too. 
and it, it's really made set up on purpose because like if it's a very rare case when you see a Slavic name and you don't understand the gender. Like my name is Diakona, it's, it's Diakona, it's clear, it's for history, it's very nice. You can see that it was woman or not. But if it's Blagih, you don't understand. So when she is reading it, yeah, there's Blagih and she's seeing a guy, she's thinking, ah, he's the, he's the uh, revision person. <clears throat> So, yeah, uh, just to show that it was not only a you know, Soviet story, there was later a French film with almost the same title, uh, Dr. François Gaillard, <laughs> about a, a female doctor in France. And it's the message what they're showing is very, very strange. She is not kind of upper middle class person. She's from the top notch elite rich people of France. Her husband <laughs> is uh, working in the French foreign ministry uh, with actually decolonized countries and he's having these venues with African diplomats. And she's clearly from a very rich family. It shows, yes, okay, for a rich person in France in the 50s probably <clears throat> get education become a doctor, but there was also a message that she had all the opportunity, all the rights, just not to work at all, just to be a wife, housewife of a high standing French politician, basically be part of some board or voluntary organization, but she's a real professional doctor and you see the story that uh, uh, she kind of respects her life and she's a respected doctor. Yeah. So there were several different topics coming all along that the Soviet Union was trying to push for. Uh, there was this uh, story about them, but in 1970s, the idea of uh, environmental protection became very important in international organizations. <clears throat> and uh, the Soviet Red Cross picked it up. In 1977, in the Soviet Union, they made an article on the constitution that all citizens have to uh, guard, the, uh, guard the nature, and you see a lot of material from 70s and 80s about uh, protecting nature in the Eastern Bloc. And it was interesting that in the British Red Cross, when they saw it first time, they were kind of pushing it back and were writing to Geneva that they're humanitarian organization, and this is a very strange topic to work with. Whereas now, all Red Cross societies uh, work with ideas of climate change. And, environmental protection. <clears throat> yeah. So the Varna Film Festival was closed in 1991. Now it's revived in new form in, 19, in 2014. But what's interesting is that it's, there, there is a similarity between what happened to uh, Varna Film Festival and other uh, initiatives that were happening in during the Cold War, but then they were not working anymore. Like the festival was organized in 1965, but there were also uh, Henri Dunant Institute organized, established in Geneva in 1965 to instruct future employees of the Red Cross <clears throat> and uh, Eastern Bloc and decolonized societies to write into Geneva to be part of the administration of the institute. They wanted more transparency, what was going on there. The institute was uh, writing history of the Red Cross. They were publishing a lot of materials back then. And after the Cold War, there were lack of interest from the uh, International Red Cross to the institute. And it was shut down in 1998 completely. So it's, you could imagine that, okay, Cold War ended, there was Bulgarian Red Cross with this festival, probably they, they should have helped it more and engaged more in the Eastern Bloc uh, country that were you know, the democratic, going through democratization and change of politics, but they were completely abandoned. And uh, in, the, in the same way as this uh, institute in, in Geneva. Uh, so yeah, you can, Yet some of the films are on YouTube uh, channel of the International uh, 
from the Federation of the Red Cross. Uh, but not all. Now coming to something more recent. So the whole movement still exists. It's not on the same uh, level as it used to be. And uh, what's going on right now, this is the list of countries that are part of the governing board of the International Federation of the Red Cross. And Russia is elected again there in June 2022, after the beginning of the war in Ukraine. What they do is that they have to have representatives of each part of the world, and Russia was representing Europe, competing with other European countries. So, and the majority of Red Cross societies, they voted for Russia to be there and not another country. There could be a lot of explanation what what it means, and there are a lot of these dynamics of non aligned world still happening. And there is a lot of criticism of how Ukrainian crisis is treated by the West. That if we imagine that it's not a <clears throat> Christian white country having troubles, they wouldn't be accepted on the same level as Ukraine refugees in the West. So, probably this is part of this resistance happening there. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll come. To my conclusion, it's still, I mean, in, 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 in developing uh, because I created the project just before the war and I didn't do the major work in Moscow archives and now I'm trying to work with things that I find around and especially in Geneva archives. So the, the project is a lot about uh, Soviet foreign policy, how they were working and trying to push for their, their ideology. But the more I'm working on this, I see a lot of this Western interest to be in this Eastern Bloc too. And when they were uh, choosing, film, for example, this Films Environment Film Festival, they had to find shared values about humanitarianism, healthcare, and influenced the Eastern Bloc too. They were showing that they had their own criticism of their system. They were modernizing their system themselves and to somehow show that the ideological Cold War didn't make much sense. It's, it looks like by 1980s, they succeeded in that. Yeah, I think that's up here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now it's... Uh, the the type of questions you know whether virtual ones or or uh, questions from our physical audience um, and if you're uh, virtual uh, please you know raise your hand um, your virtual hand meaning and and then you know I'll ask you to unmute uh, I think it's a little simply if you if you're here as well and yes the chat is open um and that's another another way of posting questions um so but let, let me actually start uh, start with a couple of questions of my own um the first one um, being about the overall trajectory of decline that you that you suggested uh, of the significance of the international red cross before and after the Cold War. And I was wondering uh, whether there is a similar trajectory and similar story to be told of other international organizations you're looking at, and what are the reasons for, for this post-war decline? Yeah. Um, then, you know, this, the second question I have is about uh, uh, the, the story of gender. Uh, and, and those uh, very interesting ratios, uh, which, I mean, obviously this 90% figure that you that you gave, at least maybe for uh, women doctors involved in, in the, in, uh, Soviet women doctors involved in the International Red Cross, uh, Red Cross is really an imagine, and for which year was this statistic? Uh, for 
for for example, for them hospital, it was the case. Mm -hmm. And then for 1960s, like 66 percent mm -hmm. were female of, in the Soviet, Soviet Union. Union. Yes, I mean obviously it's a percentage unimaginable in the United States at the time, uh, and uh, and at the same time, um, you know, in in the Soviet Union, if we look at other spheres, like you know, I'm working with writers, uh, where the percentage of, of women writers is around 15 uh, at the time, and uh, you know, for politicians, I, I don't know the statistics, but probably not not so great either. But uh, medicine or academia and their whole academic fields like history, which in the Soviet Union of that period are feminized in a way that's really unimaginable, um, unimaginable in the United States. Uh, so I wanted to, to ask you um, about, uh, you know, if you have any considerations about these uh, discrepancies, whether vis-a-vis -vis Western Europe and the United States or vis-a-vis uh, the different different spheres, uh, different professions within the Soviet Union. And let me stop here uh, and uh, maybe have you answer this question and then we can we can see whether uh, yeah people... uh, that's uh, lack of inter like lack of importance of the uh, international religious. I just, read this book of Sandrine Kot. She uh, wrote a book, uh, Governing the World. It's just published mm -hmm. by Columbia University Press, I think. And it's about this dynamics inside the United Nations. And she's writing about that the Cold War made such dynamics that people had to really argue with each other a lot. And when now people are not arguing with each other much, and there is one agency that's financing an international organization. So there is no there is no need for some intellectual effort to do something. <laughs> and that's why there is some passive passivity in the international organization. It's not only Red International Red Cross, uh, the Federation, it's for many other organizations. And kind of there is this still unipolar moment in the international organization when the United States makes the most of contribution to them and uh, there is no ideological clash within organizations and it's just not not the same thing at all. And it means that for organization to be international, you have you need to have this clash of ideas and you need to have this dynamics of people who are really opposing each other ideologically, whereas when it's one ideological framework, it's not it's not this it's not an international organization. That's the uh, I think this is how I would answer. I, I didn't work that much to make my own conclusion, but what I see from others that's it's convincing. And about gender, there is a, a lot of this Cold War explanation that lots of Soviet men were killed during the Second World War, and there was lack of labor, <clears throat> and that's why women were <laughs> involved in it. Uh, and I, actually, in the 1950s, American uh, ideology abroad, they were presenting Soviet economy as weak that couldn't provide women with what they wanted to have, is to stay at home and be with the children. And that's why they were forcing women to go and work. And this shows that the system actually doesn't work. But even without the losses of the Second World War, this idea that women have the right to work and promotion of women to get education, to become professional, it was from the very beginning of the revolution. So I think the, the war, the losses helped a lot to have more women than probably without the war, there would be less. But Ideologically, it was there always. And when I was working about India and this ideological debates, the United States Information Service, they had uh, 
conferences, they were uh, making analysis of Soviet materials published for India and American uh, materials. And they were seeing that, yeah, the Soviet Union is talking about women as doctors and other professionals a lot more, and we are not. And the US uh, Information Agency had a, a person who worked on women's issues appointed first time in 1958. And it was in the 60s when it started to look really weird if they don't talk about these things. And in Western Europe, they were rapidly having more women in, in, professional, uh, in, in professions. And by 1970s, America really lagged behind, not Soviet Union, but Western Europe too, France and Britain and Western Germany. And by the, in the 1980s, it was really a, a, an issue. And I think the first time Americans sent a woman to space was in 1983. Yeah. Whereas Soviet Union did it in the 1960s. Uh, yeah, there, there was, uh, we were talking to other researchers about whether there was a, <clears throat> a document in the ideological department of the party where they would say that these are professions for women and these are for men. I doubt that such document exists ideologically. I think it was unacceptable to uh, do it, but in practice it existed. They were writing it, describing it in such a strange way, saying that old, in medicine there is a lot more care and it's very natural for women to be part of it, but uh, there were like chemistry and biology also for women and kind of they were saying, but this is just common sense. And there was this culture of uh, division, labor division in, in the Eastern Bloc that we can grasp and understand by practice and by numbers, but uh, it's very hard to see what was what was their understanding, how they decided this is for women. This place. And so there was no uh, particular concern about uh, um, gender balance within particular fields, you know, so just speaking within, you know, the fields I'm interested in, filmmaking or uh, uh, writing, which were, uh, which were, you know, the level of directors or writers, you know, overwhelmingly male, there was, uh, uh, you would suggest there was no particular interest on part of Soviet uh, uh, leadership in addressing these balances? Were these such questions? I'm sorry, I realized this might be taking you away from from the main subject of the Red Cross, but, but you don't think there was any effort to redress these huge imbalances in these fields and the male, the male domination? I think, I, I suppose that they were um, trying to create uh, feminized professions where like medicine would be majority would be women. Mm -hmm. And that was their goal, not the equality, but they kind of create this uh, hierarchy of professions, have a lot of professional women, and they would take the majority of, of this profession. There was things like that. And I guess filmmaking was not mm -hmm. in the list of it. And there, there, there was no, it was some, socialist culture of uh, gender division that uh, we, we don't know how. It's, it's interesting to understand, but we don't see any clear documents how they did it. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so a lot of questions, whether virtual or, uh, or video. Sorry, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, sorry, my name is Amadian. I'm currently at the CUNY Graduate Center of Business Study. We went to the Um, I was wondering about these women doctors abroad. Do you have any access to legal documents? Do you know anything about their life or the, the motivation to go on a mission with the Red Cross to a foreign country? Or did they take their family along? Or were they single where they were? Do, do you have any access to their experience? No, I. I... I don't now at the moment, but it's possible to work on that. And uh, um, Rachel Applebaum, Professor Tufts, she's working on the Soviet teachers of Russian in Africa. And she did a lot of work on that. Uh, how much 
free people were not to go to operation abroad. They, most likely they were not, it was very hard to refuse. Like the, the Soviet Red Cross was existing almost like a virtual organization when people were just doctors at, at their city where they were. They were part of the Red Cross and then there would be a call for a mission to go somewhere and they would pick up someone trustworthy and send them. And as there were no other, they were all women, they would send women. And in many cases, like for teachers, what Rachel Kovac does that they, they would have to leave for a year, and they didn't want to renew another year because of the, they want to come back to the family. So I think for doctors it was the same. But there were lots of financial considerations that, uh, for example, they would earn money while going abroad. They would have salaries of the Red Cross when they're abroad, and they would keep their salary from their colleagues. So, uh, it's not very much, they, they were not really free to refuse to go. Other questions, Alex? Yeah, my name is Alex, which I think I'm from very Shanghai. Uh, I have a question about environmentalism. Uh, you mentioned that in the 70s and the 80s, uh, the Soviets actively produced this kind of posters and other uh, cultural products about the environment. So I was interested in why they did this and why uh, they did this kind of under the umbrella of the Red Cross. So that was kind of an innovative thing, right? Um, no other country did that. Uh, I, well, the, the, the topic became international in 72 when the UN made the first conference on environmental protection. And the legal Red Cross was there participating, and it was the um, um, General Secretary General of the League of the Red Cross, Eric Beer, who was really pushing for environmental protection as a topic for the Red Cross state. But in the Eastern Bloc, they somehow picked it up a lot quicker. And uh, very interesting to say, yeah, why? Because the Soviet Union was a highly industrialized country with a lot of pollution. And uh, like, I, I can't tell why, but it was. Like kind of they were probably envisioning that there would be technological change from uh, industrialized society to post-industrial and they create this value for nature to save it and maybe that. So I, I'm not sure, but clearly in the Eastern Bloc, they were very much active about talking on the ground. Other questions from our virtual participants or uh, Anastasia. Hello, my name is Anastasia Vasnikova. I'm a postdoc here at the Financial Aid Center. So my question is the following. Based on what you presented, it looks like the Red Cross uh, mostly focused on providing health care, different forms of health care. Yet before this talk, I uh, checked what the Red Cross in Russia is doing right now. And it looks like they are mostly focusing on uh, connecting victims of the ongoing invasion with their relatives, which is a humanitarian cause, but this is not out here. My understanding is that the Red Cross in Russia right now is uh, as limited in their abilities to operate freely as they were during the Soviet times, right? So why are we observing this shift in your opinion from like health care to something else? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, great. I just didn't talk about it, but it's not new, no. Um, uh, the work of the International Commission of the Red Cross was always about uh, prisoners of war. And after the Second World War, they were working a lot about uh, giving information about German, Germans killed in the Soviet Union. And Soviet Union, Soviet Red Cross was working a lot with making lists. And uh, it was always this um, practice and they worked on this, Think of gathering information about prisoners of war, and it's very interesting that in the fifties and sixties and seventies, Soviet Red Cross was the only Soviet organization that would talk about human rights, would be close to this idea of human rights and humanitarianism, and that's why like Western humanitarian organizations when they were trying to make a protest or 
address someone in the Soviet Union for help about political prisoners in the Soviet Union, they were writing to the Soviet Red Cross of Moscow. And there are documents from the Open Society in Budapest when they are writing about uh, Soviet political prisoners, Soviet prisons, uh, critics, and, and, and writing to Mitirov, which is directly. Uh, so it's not, it's not new. That's what they were always doing. But uh, so the like Russian Red Cross is a lot smaller organization. What I saw, their budget is something like $2 million a year or something. And what they get funding from the International Commission of Red Cross. And I don't know, I don't know if it's most of this money is from Geneva or not. So it's a very weak organization, but it's not the same level that we can compare it. And now everywhere Red Cross societies are not what used to be. They created this franchise of non-governmental, secular, voluntary organizations. Uh, but now there are a lot more NGOs that exist for certain projects and they're more active than any Red Cross society. Other questions? I have a couple of my own, but would be more interesting to hear from others. Okay, if, if none, let me let me <laughs> ask you. Uh, you know, so uh, one of the uh, main ideas you started with was uh, about the, the clash of different visions of humanitarianism, uh, which, which I assume uh, you know was waged throughout this body, uh, you know, the International Red Cross throughout the uh, the Cold War era. And I was wondering, you know, if you could illustrate it, maybe or specific aspects um, of this uh, clashing aspects of this understanding of humanitarianism uh, on on both parts of the uh, both protagonists of the Cold War and uh, the involvement, especially of uh, the global South uh, in in that debate, or, or did the global South? Uh, Try to offer its own vision of Red Cross humanitarianism distinct from that of the superpowers, as it did in, in some occasions, like the new information order that uh, many countries of the global south proposed, you know, which, which was primarily meant to challenge um, American hegemony, but was very independent of, of Soviet um, of, of the Soviet Union. So that's that would be my first and probably main question. Uh, a secondary question would be uh, about the Red Crescent and was there a Soviet Red Crescent and uh, how distinct was it, if, if at all, from the Red Cross? Let me uh, and, and the third one. Okay, let me ask it uh, if if you remember, but about the revival of the. Of the Sofia yeah. Film Festival, sorry, the Varna Film Festival of the Red Cross. So what is motivating that that revival? And is it part of a pattern with such international organizations, or is it just a strange product of local dynamics? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, about the uh, visions of humanitarian. The Soviet Union was, this Eastern Bloc were pushing for this idea that of fighting for peace in the Cold War. And there could not be any neutrality in the Cold War. And the Western understanding of humanitarianism was that there is a space of neutral, apolitical action that's human, humanitarian aid. And it, was, it should always be the case for international Red Cross movement. And the Western Red Cross societies were always <laughs> uh, accusing the Soviet Red Cross of politicizing the movement. They were constantly talking about the Soviet and the Chinese, they're politicizing uh, all the international conferences <laughs> of the Red Cross. So for this socialist idea of uh, neutrality was that if you are talking about neutrality and you're thinking that it exists, it means that you're right wing. So there couldn't be any neutrality. And it was the already 
in conference in Toronto in 1952, when they were talking, the Chinese were bringing up the topic of the Korean uh, prisoners of war, that Red Cross has to work with them. There is the uh, Korean war, this, this major political conflict, and we cannot be out of political discussions. So, <clears throat> uh, and the further idea of the uh, humanitarian for the Soviet Red Cross was that humanitarianism, their initial values, they are the same as social. So it's not neutral in its very basis why it will happen. And uh, that was the central clash of the Red Cross movement. About the question, yeah, it was uh, uh, first the major countries they created Red Cross Society, then the Ottoman Empire was first to create the Red Christian Society, selling that they cannot have the Christian symbol. And uh, it's very interesting to see why the communist countries really kept with the Christian symbol in the first place, as if it, they never had any troubles with it. <clears throat> During the revolution, there were uh, voluntary proletarian Red Cross to help the revolutionaries in, in the Russian Empire. And kind of there was this uh, very clear secular um, image of the Red Cross that it's not a Christian organization, but they had the, the symbol. Like Japan had the Japanese Red Cross and still has it. And apparently there was no, never a problem with that. Uh, there was no one Soviet Red Cross Society. There was an alliance of Soviet Red Cross and Red Christian societies. And the uh, Azerbaijan, Central Asian republics, they had Red Christian. And there was Ukrainian Red Cross, there was Russian Red Cross, there was uh, Georgian Red Cross. So, like in Pakistan, there was uh, Pakistani Red Cross until 71, and then they changed from Red Christian. About the revival, I don't know. It's very interesting that if the, the festival exists now, but it's not this A level international film festival. Uh, and I think there is no dynamics of this to, to have it, to have the same international play. Uh, it looks like the Bulgarian Red Cross really wanted to revive it, and finally they somehow managed to get the funding and to make it and it existed. Any last questions? Well if if not, really thank you Severian. This was an education and thank you to all who came. Yeah. Thanks.